Hello, everyone. I love that idea of a baby universe. I kind of want to take it home and look after it <laughs> as it starts. Um, I'm going to break out and stand over here. Is that all right for sound and lighting? OK. Um, so my name's Casper Terkyle. Yes, indeed, I'm training to be a minister for non-religious people. Um, but I'm very happy to be with you all on Friday, because Friday is my favorite day. About a year and a half ago, um, I'm in a divinity school, so I'm learning about all these different religious practices and kind of the history of, of religion. And uh, someone started telling me about Sabbath. I was like, well, sure, that was something that was relevant to people hundreds of years ago, but not to me. But um, then I found a website that started to, started to talk about a tech Sabbath. So I thought, OK, that could be interesting. So on Friday nights, today, uh, I, when it gets dark outside, I take out my phone, I kind of gaze longingly at its screen, you know, my dear friend who speaks to me all day, and I turn it off brutally. Um, I do the same with my laptop. I put them in a drawer, out of sight, and then for 24 hours, I kind of enjoy this, this liberating holiday, really. No one can reach me, it's fabulous. Um, usually I, I, I stare out of the window, I might read a little, um, I've started to be bored for the first time in years. It's really rather remarkable. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, but what's been lovely about this idea of a, a tech Sabbath is um, reconnecting with ritual. Um, I grew up at home uh, in a non-religious home uh, in Sussex. Um, there wasn't really anything remarkable about it. But you know that, that moment where a candle was lit at the dinner table, there was just a little something magical about that. Um, nothing particularly ascribed to it or said about it, but just that act of, of lighting a candle. So I do the same. I put the phone and the laptop away. I grab a match. I light a candle. And then I sing myself a little song, which you do not worry. I will not sing for you now. But doing that every Friday for the last year and a half has really changed my relationship to time. Um, it's, it's created a sort of rhythm of activity and rest. And it really is like going on holiday. Uh, the great Jewish uh, theologian Abraham Joshua Heschel called it a great festival of freedom. Um, and you're supposed to, it's not about kind of doing nothing, it's about enjoying what is being present. So you're supposed to have good conversation with the people you love and a good meal. Uh, you're also supposed to make love. So that's you know something uh, we can all take to heart. Um, but the, there's something in this ritual, something in these religious practices, which I thought was interesting for us to think about in the context of Lumiere. Um, particularly because the way we think about religion, I think is often really wrong. Uh, mostly we, we think religion, well, that equals believing in something. You know, I have to believe that God created the world in six days, or that Jonah lived in a whale, or that you know, Jesus Christ died to save, your sins, uh, save you from your sins. But sociologists of religion, really disagree, Be belonging and the practice of religion is actually much more important in terms of how people live out their faith. Um, so people like Nancy Ammerman or Diana Butler Bass will, will look at how people's faith journeys happen, for example, and very rarely does someone kind of wake up in the middle of the night or journey to Damascus and realize, uh, you know, some sort of Damascene moment much more likely it is that they'll become um, befriended with someone, they'll meet a community, they'll start doing what that community does, and over time they'll start to tell themselves a different story about who they are and why they do what they do. So if we start to think about religion in this way, what might that say um, about festivals like Lumiere and other things that we might engage in uh, whether we're religious or non-religious. So as I said, I'm training to be a minister for non-religious people, and that, that might sound very, very strange. But who's read Religion for Atheists, Alain de Botton's book? Well, good for you. <laughs> it's a great book, have a read. Um, essentially, he's arguing that the way we uh, relate to art, for example, or uh, architecture, um, echoes kind of traditional religious themes. Um, so really, that's, that's what I'm studying. Um, and if we think about Lumiere, you know, the way that we heard this morning, cities need to have a soul, Manira said, which I thought was really interesting. Um, if, we, if we think about how we walk around the streets, which are now transformed, these spaces that we know very intimately are now completely changed. The way we interact with space changes. The way we think of ourselves might change in that moment as well. There's something about gathering together to wonder at the enormity of everything. You know, I'm really looking forward to standing in front of the cathedral and watching that story of the cosmos, because I think there's something about that which makes us feel very small, but also very big at the same time. Um, so I want to kind of explore what that might be about. 
So what I do is I study secular organizations and see how they kind of mirror traditional religious functions. Um, does anyone know about CrossFit? A couple of people, a couple of nods. Okay, this is a very intense workout community. It is enormous. They have 15,000 gyms across the world. More than 4 million people are engaging in these workouts every single day. And it's the same workout that's happening all across the world at the same time. They call them workouts of the day. Um, so you can start to see perhaps the liturgical element of these different workouts. They even name them after soldiers who have died in battle. So there's this kind of memorializing and storytelling. There's the CrossFit Games that happen every summer where the, kind of, the tribe gathers in California and they watch each other and help each other compete um, to see who is the most kind of elite athlete. But you can see, you know, even, even in the way that they're lined up to do their squats, um, there's something very powerful about this community. Um, you know, we, you might laugh and think, oh, that's you know, a silly idea, but they're very powerful. Um, when someone needs to go to the hospital, these will be the people who bring them. Uh, people meet their partners here and bring their kids into the gym. Uh, all sorts of, in America, obviously, healthcare is always an issue. People will start fundraising for one another's healthcare in, terms of, in, in times of crisis. So there's all these kind of traditional community functions that you're starting to see in a place like a gym, which ought to just be for working out. Another great favorite is Soul Cycle, which is a spinning class where you sit in rows in total darkness with candles and very loud music. Again, this kind of liturgical element. Um, and traditionally, uh, in, in some congregations, particularly in New England and America, uh, you know, you would pay for your pew. So to sit in the front row had a great kind of honor and prestige because you were able to pay for it. For Soul Cycle, if you want to book your spin bike in the front row, uh, you can do it normally with everyone else on a Monday and pay $35 for it. But you can also buy for $10,000 the right to book on Sunday so that you're able to get in the front row. So the same kind of dynamics are happening in these secular workout spaces that you might have found in a church. Another favorite example I have is, is maker spaces, um, places where people get together to weld and solder and make and create, um, design kind of interesting spacey ships, which are actually kind of double, uh, you know, double bicycles on top of each other with crazy wings, all sorts of amazing things that happen in these spaces. Obviously a great outlet for creativity and, and a building of community. But the one near me in Boston um, is open 24 hours a day. And for people who are struggling with all sorts of issues who might suddenly need a place to sleep or um, you know, are worried that they're going to self-harm and need a place to, to be active and do something, will come to the maker space. So it's become a sort of refuge as much as anything else. Again, something a church might have traditionally done. Group Muse is one of my favorite examples. It's a, a simple uh, web app um, where you can organize classical music concerts in your own home. So it matches you with musicians if you have a nice living room, or if you're a, mus you're, you're a musician and you need a nice living room to play in, it kind of matches those two things, plus then an audience who will come. So uh, often it's an intergenerational gathering, something very important in, in religious community, um, but also it offers a, an experience of beauty, um, uh, perhaps a, a time to reflect, um, something that, again, might have happened in a religious community. You could even think about the, the kind of, you know, you're listening to a gorgeous piece of Mozart, perhaps. You're sitting there thinking about your day. You might set some intentions about the kind of person you want to be, perhaps some element of prayer in this experience as well. So in all of these examples, I, I kind of want to challenge our idea of, of what it is to be religious. Um, one of my favorite uh, theologians, Richard Rohr, who's a, a Franciscan, says religion is really the, the act of reminding us who we are. Well, the Irish poet John O'Donoghue says, it's the act of returning home to the place where we have never been wounded. And if, if that's religion, that sounds quite lovely to me. Uh, I, I, I think I might want to try that. And so I, I, I want to challenge us to think, if we do see religion in these secular practices, what other resources, what other responsibilities might these communities, might these practices offer to us? The last example uh, I'll use kind of that we've been mapping is um, early morning dance raves. Has anyone participated in these? Yes. Were they fun? Quite fun. Good. Uh, 
So this happens from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. usually, no alcohol, but fantastic music, crazy costumes, people have an amazing time before they go to work. Um, what's interesting is that, you know, obviously there's this amazing kind of ecstatic dance, ecstatic ritual that you might have, find, might, might have found um, in history. But the DJs often are kind of giving Im like inspirational words as you're losing yourself in the music. You know, things like I went to one recently and he, the guy was kind of saying, we are all one, you know, we're all one. And I was like, okay, great. Uh, um, but so there's this element of a sort of inspirational ecstatic sermon happening um, as you're all dancing, engaging in this practice. One of my, um, <laughs> before you laugh, I'm leading this class, so don't. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's lots of kind of maybe subtle examples, but a, a friend and I, Vanessa Zoltan and I, uh, wanted to explore, could we make a really uh, obvious link to religion with some sort of community-led element? Um, so we, we, she had led a class on Jane Eyre as a sacred text. Um, and so I, you know, I'm a big Harry Potter fan, and that's not why I chose the glasses, but I do now <laughs> realize that those two might be related. Um, so I thought, well, you know, I didn't grow up with the Bible. I didn't grow up with, with a sort of religious text. But I remember reading Harry Potter, and it was, it was a really uh, sort of moral foundation for me. Um, and the amount of readers that it's had, particularly young adult readers who are growing up now, these stories of Dumbledore and Harry and Hermione are really still kind of in our fabric of who we are. Um, so we thought, well, let's try and do a close reading of this text. So over six months, we're reading all seven books, getting together every week for an hour and a half with a group of about 30 folks, um, and sitting down and doing close readings of these, of these books. We're just about to end Prisoner of Azkaban, so it's very exciting. Um, but uh, it's remarkable what you can find in these secular texts to teach us about life. So our definition of sacred is that the more you dig into the text, the more you give it your energy and your interest, the more gifts it will give you, the more meaning it will have. And it was amazing. In our first class, um, you know, it opens with the Dursleys, a kind of archetypal, um, you know, nasty neighbors. Um, and Petunia Dursley is described as having a long neck. And so we thought, well, let's focus in on that passage. What on earth could we learn from Petunia Dursley having a long neck? And one of the participants said, well, you know, I feel like I'm Petunia Dursley sometimes when I'm on Facebook because I'm kind of peering over the proverbial fence onto someone else's profile. And I feel like I, I'm doing the same thing that she does and kind of judging and, and making myself feel worse as I do that. And we ended up in a really interesting discussion about kind of presentation of self on social media and in everyday life. So it's, it's a really wonderful way to dig into questions of meaning. Um, for those of you who are fans, you'll know that book three is when we meet Remus Lupin, the werewolf defense against the dark arts teacher. And the first lesson he does, he has a bogart, which is a magical creature uh, which hides in dark places. And when it escapes and becomes visible, it turns into the thing that you fear most. Uh, and Neville Longbottom sees kind of Professor Snape, and he's very frightened. And the way that you have to deal with that fear is by turning it into something that will make you laugh, because laughter is what overpowers the bogart. So we had a fabulous discussion this week about, well, what is it that we are afraid of? And how can we engage with that question and, and think about making it into something that we can laugh at, or that we can be, um, you know, that we can have a different relationship with rather than just fearing it? So there's, there's real interesting practices that can be done uh, with, you know, a traditional practice like Lectio Divina, sacred reading, that you could do with a secular text, which, uh, which we've had a lot of fun with. Throughout this kind of mapping of these different organizations, we've, we've been finding six themes that come up, come up time and time again. Personal transformation, the idea that you yourself will be changed somehow, whether it's physically or emotionally or um, in some other way. Social transformation, so something that in the world that changes, that might be a justice issue, um, structures of inequality, or it might be simply that the space changes. Um, Creativity, you're engaging your, your inner creative spirit, you're creating, not consuming. Um, purpose finding, which is really thinking about um, how am I clear about what I want to do with my life um, in, in whatever way that might be. Accountability, this is what I think actually religion is getting worse and worse at and secular groups are getting better and better at. If you say you're going to do it, well, let's see you do it. Um, and so with CrossFit, uh, just to go back to my very favorite example, 
Uh, a friend of mine, you know, is there five, six days a week. When she goes on holiday, she has to let the rest of the gym know because if she doesn't show up, they'll call her and say, Ali, where are you? Uh, now, would that happen in a church these days? I'm not so sure. It's not necessarily something you'd want always as well, but uh, it's definitely a theme that we've seen. And finally, and most importantly, community. All of these organizations have, whether it's manifestos or on their websites, they're talking about the, the crisis of isolation and the desire to bring people into community. But all of these are, they're true, and there's something more. Um, this theme is the one that we're most interested in, and I think it's, you know, if I was thinking of Lumiere, you've definitely got the creativity, all, you know, all these students engaging and participating in these projects. You've definitely got social transformation, but it's all pointing towards something more, uh, and it's difficult to give language to that. Uh, I think my, my favorite attempt is by Meister Eckhart, who was a, a German um, kind of mystic in the 14th century, who said in Middle High German, Gott wird und und wird which means God becomes and unbecomes, which really means that um, God is only our name for it, uh, that the closer you get to it, the less you understand about it at all. And so I think that's really what something like Lumiere does for all of us. It, it invites us to ask questions about who we are and why we're here and what we're doing and where we're going. Um, it, it brings us together, you know, definitely within a city, but also visitors are coming as families, or you might speak with an interesting conversation, have an interesting conversation with a stranger. Events like these take us out of ourselves and, and open the world, um, which I think is something that I've found through my, my tech Sabbath practice, uh, and I hope I can invite each of you to, to think about how you may, might make time to bring light, whether it's a candle or a poem, uh, into your own life uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So thank you very much for having me. I end with this lovely Hogwarts picture for those of you who are fans. Thank you.